to our next panel. Um, it's a one-man show. It was supposed to be a bit bigger, but now uh, all attention will be focused on Dr. Henning Tan, uh, who holds a PhD from the University of Oxford. He's joined St. Andrews in 2016. His research centers on um, state, support, state support for rebel groups, so he's looking at the motive for African leaders to, to sponsor uh, rebel groups, and he has found that often those leaders form alliances with rebel groups abroad to mitigate threats against themselves in their home country. His other research focuses on rebel group fragmentation, so why and how they split, and he's currently conducting a research project on the issue of how they split with support from the Carnegie Trust. Uh, Henning has published widely in journals such as International Studies Quarterly, International Security, and African Affairs, and today he will be speaking about mutual interventions in Africa and beyond, exploring an understudied type of conflict. So without much further ado, just maybe one comment, we will have this session a bit shorter than as indicated in the um, schedule, simply because we have a shorter panel as well, so we aim to uh, finish this one at around uh, 2.30. But without much further ado now, let me hand the floor over to Henning. And yours. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, last man standing, literally now. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you to Tim and the whole CSTPB team for, for putting this together. Um, very happy to have the opportunity um, to speak. So I'm presenting a uh, work in progress, uh, work together with Alain Dursman, just to give you a bit of background, Alain and I started this project many years ago when he was just finishing his PhD in Oxford and I was just transitioning from my PhD into, into a postdoc. And Alain's PhD project looked at mediation in African conflicts. And uh, his fieldwork was primarily in Sudan, but he always had an interest in patterns of conflict across the continent. Uh, my research was, as you heard, an excellent support for rival groups. My field was primarily in the DRC and Congo, but again, I was also interested in, in wider patterns. And so Sudan, Congo, remember those two countries, you'll understand later on why we ended up looking at what we now call mutual interventions. Um, so yeah, mutual interventions in Africa and beyond, exploring an understudied uh, type of conflict. I thought this paper would work quite well, sort of following um, Safi's presentation, looking at different types of, of political violence. So what is a mutual intervention? Um, we follow Lionel Cliff here, who wrote, who used that term writing about the Horn of Africa, regional dimensions of conflict in the Horn of Africa. So a mutual intervention refers to two states simultaneously intervening in each other's interstate conflicts, civil conflicts, by supporting rebel groups. And most of the mutual interventions we see in the world um, have occurred in Africa. So in, in the data that Alain and I collected, there are 23 mutual interventions. I'll say MIs now, to keep things short. 23 MIs between 1969 and 2010. Um, but, so it is primarily an African phenomenon, but there are some cases outside of Africa. So just to uh, highlight two here in the Middle East, during the Iran-Iraq War, 1980 to 1988, in the later years, Iran also supported an Iraqi rebel group, that was the Skiri, Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, um, whereas Iraq supported an Iranian rebel group called the Mujahideen de Kalkra, the MDK. And so that happened both during the Iranian war, Iraq war, so in the context of this interstate war, but it also continued after the interstate war had ended. They were still supporting each other's rebels. An example from Asia would be Afghanistan in the late 1990s under the Taliban, where the Afghan Taliban regime provided support uh, to the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the IMU, and Uzbekistan retaliated by supporting the anti-Taliban Northern Alliance, the Northern Alliance, uh, that's the people that the US then worked with when they later overthrew um, the Taliban regime uh, after 9-11. So uh, what I present today is what Alad and I are currently drafting as a research note. Um, we also have two full um, article-length papers, or we're working on two papers. One looks specifically at the termination of mutual interventions, the other at the role that the part mediation plays. And I'll talk a little bit about termination today, of course, to highlight why we think this is a particularly interesting ph phenomenon when it comes to mutual interventions. Um, but so the points here show you the outline of the talk. I first want to 
um, talk about how the concept of mutual intervention relates to other concepts, and I say here that address hostile interactions between states, because some of these con concepts are not exactly about conflict, but something like conflict. And then I'll give you a systematic overview of mutual interventions in post-colonial or in independent Africa. That's the, the data collection that I, I, I've been doing. And then I'll compare how uh, mutual interventions terminate relative to how interstate conflicts in Africa terminate, just to drive home the point that these are separate, that these are distinct phenomena, although they, of course, often are linked, are connected, uh, if you think about um, what, what studies were saying earlier. And so there's two key findings I should maybe say, uh, I have that on the concluding slide, if I were hyperbolic, I would say that one of the key points is that mutual interventions is how African states actually fight each other. So if you think about a substitution logic, African states almost never go to war with each other directly in an interstate conflict, but they do quite frequently fight each other indirectly by supporting each other's domestic opposition groups. Um, but the other key findings uh, that I want to highlight is, as I already said, how MIs terminate is not the same as how interstate conflicts terminate. And then what we thought was really striking is that more than two-thirds of MIs end uh, through a negotiated settlement where states come together and actually find a solution and they both afterwards actually stop supporting each other's rebels despite all the challenges because external support can be covert, yeah, it's hard to detect, hard to monitor, yet they actually manage to find a solution uh, that, that lasts in most cases. And then also partly because uh, Stathis is in the room and Stathis had a very influential uh, 2010 article together with Leiber Sales in uh, American Political Science Review where he highlights the importance that the Cold War and the end of the Cold War had uh, on specifically the technology of rebellion, how civil wars are fought, and so I want to look here at the role that non-African state supporters, extra-continental state supporters, played and how that differed in the Cold War period and then the post-Cold um, War period. So, again, let's try and distinguish mutual interventions uh, from, from related uh, concepts. Uh, you might know Noel Anderson's recent work, building on an MIT PhD, on what he calls competitive interventions, and here's a research note in ISQ um, on that topic. So there, there's a difference between mutual interventions and competitive interventions. In a mutual intervention, each state supports rebel groups that target the other state. So in terms of interstate conflicts, we're looking at two interstate conflicts that make up a mutual intervention. By contrast, in a competitive intervention, one state supports the government in a third state, the other state supports the rebels in that third state. So here, the actual fighting is taking place just in one conflict. And I know a, a lot of these com uh, relationships are quite complex and hard to follow, so I hope the visualization helps a little, uh, helps a little bit. So as an example of mutual intervention, take Chad and Sudan between 2005 and uh, 2010. Chad supports Sudanese rebels. The Sudanese rebels fight Sudan. Sudan supports Chadian rebels, the Chadian rebels fight the government of Chad. Uh, by contrast, the competitive intervention, to take an example um, from what Mark Lynch calls uh, the New Middle Eastern proxy wars. So in the Syrian civil war, what we see is Iran providing support to the Syrian regime, and then Iran's rival, Iran's competitor, Saudi Arabia, providing support to Syrian rebels. So that's a competitive intervention. But here the fighting is all taking place in Syria. Yeah? The sponsors are not also the targets of violence. Um, we then distinguish between two types of mutual interventions, indirect um, or mixed. So in an indirect mutual intervention, both states support rebels in the other state um, with anything other than troops. They do not send troops across the border uh, to fight alongside the rebels. So you could call that indirect or proxy mutual interventions. Mixed mutual interventions involve on one side cross-border troop support from the state um, to the rebels fighting um, the other state, whereas the other state provides support short of troops. Yeah, so money, guns, but it doesn't send troops um, across the border. In principle, there could be direct mutual interventions where both states send troops across the border that fight alongside rebels, but we've not identified uh, any such 
Um, moving on then, although one can distinguish quite clearly between mutual interventions and uh, competitive interventions, they do actually overlap. Again, I think this resonates with uh, what, what Sadis was talking about with, with his different types of political violence. So let's take the example of the Angolan Civil War, the period from 1976 to 1988. There was a mutual intervention going on between Angola and South Africa. So Angola supported SWAPO, that's the liberation movement that was trying to liberate Namibia, uh, which was under South Africa's rule. And Angola also supported the ANC, Nelson Mandela's um, rebels fighting uh, apartheid in South Africa. Uh, whereas South Africa supported UNITA, the main rebel group, the main Angolan rebel group um, that was fighting uh, the socialist Angolan uh, government. But at the same time, there was also a competitive intervention that speaks to this idea of Cold War, proxy wars, although strictly speaking, uh, Cuba actually sent troops. So what Cuba did was not proxy warfare, um, but direct troop support. But so the Soviet Union and Cuba provided support to the Angolan government, whereas the United States supported the Angolan rebel group, um, UNITA. Um, yeah, different concepts, but empirically they sometimes overlap. So as I already mentioned, indirect mutual interventions which people sometimes think of as proxy conflict, at, or we could call proxy conflicts, and Cecil Brewer calls them reciprocal proxy conflicts, because they don't involve troop support. But the cases that we call mixed mutual interventions, one can't call proxy conflicts, because if you look at the literature on proxy war, and some of you in the room might know that Alad and I actually changed our mind on this, we used to follow uh, what I call the dissenting voice here, the right use understanding of proxy War, but actually, most scholars studying proxy conflict follow um, Andrew Mumford's understanding where they say indirect intervention is the fundamental element of proxy war. That means support short of troops. Once you send troops to help uh, the rebels, then it's a direct intervention. Yeah, and so if you look at Basim Antov's article, I mean, Selekian's article, Vladimir Rauter, student of Mumford's, they all share Mumford's um, understanding. So some of the initial interventions we're looking at, one shouldn't call um, proxy conflicts. We would say just that one of the two states involved in these mutual interventions uses proxy warfare, but the mutual intervention as a whole is not a proxy war or a proxy conflict. Um, moving on then, uh, I don't know how many of you are sort of into the quantitative study of interstate um, conflict, um, there is a, a big literature on rivalries, interstate rivalries. Some of that is actually also qualitative. Um, but so our concept is very similar to a subtype of rivalries um, that Thompson and Rea call interventionary rivalries. And they define that as states intruding into the internal affairs of other states as a means of reducing external threat or acquiring leverage in the other states' um, decision making. So they actually just like uh, I do borrow from Cliff's discussion, um, but the difference here is that rivalry is a much broader concept. Rivalry doesn't require that both states uh, provide support to rebel groups. There's actually two different ways of studying rivalries, and so Thompson is the Thompson and lots of co-authors uh, is the first approach. Thompson himself calls that the more subjective approach, where what they define as rivalry, they basically look at who decision makers themselves or the historians of these countries say are or have been the competitive or threatening enemies of the states in question. There is also a more objective approach to studying interstate rivalries, um, that is uh, Gertz and Deal, and then in this article also together with Klein, um, where, where the definition requires that there were three or more militarized interstate disputes, myths, in a 10 to 15 year time period. Now, I don't know how many of you sort of know that literature, which is very quantitative on, on MIDs, but a MID is defined as a set of incidents involving the deliberate overt government sanctioned and government directed threat display or use of force between two or more states. So, the lowest level of hostility in a MID is just someone making threats, a state making threats against another state. The highest level is full scale interstate war. Yeah, this is a concept people came up because there are so few full-scale interstate wars, but they want to study hostile interactions between states, so they try to find phenomena that fall short of, of war, but still you see some right militarized dispute. Um, again, you can see here, if we think of how do MIs and MIDs um, relate to each other, again, 
there's no mention here of support for rebel groups, right? So there might be an overlap, but MI is a much more specific concept. Uh, finally, there's a literature which I would think of maybe it's a little old-fashioned or some of that work dates back. It's not quite as influential, I would say, um, but the International Crisis Behavior Project, ICB, so this concept of international crises and Brecker and Wilkenfeld is the standard citation there. The Brecker has published several books on crises. So just briefly, they define an international crisis as increased disruptive interactions between states that lead to a heightened probability of military hostilities and that challenge the structure of an international system. I won't sort of go through each word. They do that in great detail in their book. But uh, we just bring that up here because we compare some of the crisis data to our data. And so just to summarize, neither rivalries nor militarized interstate disputes nor crises conceptually require any involvement of rebel groups, whereas our concept of mutual interventions does. And so it's a more specific concept that may or may not overlap. And so I haven't told you yet how exactly we then coded mutual interventions, but just to give you a sense empirically of this overlap, uh, we looked at data sets, so for war, uh, war, we actually look at the correlates of war um, project data and then uh, international crises. I just mentioned all the disputes, that's the mids, and rivalries. And the unit of analysis here in the background, what the data is built on, is a mutual intervention year. So if you think of Angola and South Africa, starts in 76. So Angola, South Africa, 76. Angola, South Africa, 77. Angola, South Africa, 78. A mutual intervention year. And the middle bars here, we then look at, in these 105 mutual intervention years, how often do these other data sets also code a war occurring, or a crisis, or a dispute, or a rivalry? So you'll see the biggest overlap by far um, is with rivalry, yeah, 88%. And if you think about how rivalry is conceptualized, maybe it should be 100% if um, these scholars hadn't missed some cases, one could argue, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But so there's a big overlap there. Militarized disputes, it's basically every other year where there is a mutual intervention, a militarized dispute between the two states is coded. International crisis, a little lower, just 39%. War, it's just 1%. It's a single observation. Um, it's the war over Angola, the Corridors of War Project codes, where um, South Africa provided direct troop support in 76. Um, but that's really the, the exception. And then we also look at the five years, or up to five years before mutual intervention starts, and the five years after what the overlap is there. You can see the figures here. I won't talk through um, the details, but just to give you a sense um, of actual data and what the overlap is. OK, so I jumped ahead there a little bit. So let's take back one step. This is a bit technical, but it, it speaks to the issue. So we had a discussion when studies presented different types. And then like, what if we actually try and measure things? We need to come up with some criteria. And there's all kinds of challenges. So I just want to speak about those a little bit. And given that the other panelist is out, I have a bit more time. I guess I can do so. Excuse me. Um, So the onset or beginning of a mutual intervention, what criteria do we use? The first criteria is that we only consider rebel groups that are listed in the UCDP, that's the Uppsala Peace Research Institute Oslo, um, on conflict data set, or ACD, for that year. And so that introduces quite a low threshold, but it does introduce the threshold that those rebel groups need to be involved in a conflict with the government that they fight, and that there need to be at least 25 battle-related deaths in that year. Yeah? This is just to exclude some sort of mini rebel groups that maybe received a little bit of support. And this is partly just to make it feasible, because there's always all kinds of rumors about support of very small rebel groups that receive support from neighboring countries. But reliable data is hard to find unless those are you know, somewhat significant rebel groups actually putting up a proper fight. The second criteria is just um, so we link our data collection to the UCP external support data set, and uh, we consider the types of support um, that they list, which is actually quite comprehensive, so there's not a particularly constraining um, criterion. So you see troops, the secondary warring party, yeah, troop support, and then there are all the non-warring uh, types of support, as the UCP calls it, so access to military or intelligence infrastructure access to territory, as often called yeah, ex external or foreign sanctuary, um, weapons, material or logistic support, training or expertise, funding or economic support, and then finally a provision sharing of intelligence 
material. Uh, we're quite happy with the data that the UCB collected from 75 to 2009. We just make a few small corrections based on the expert literature, and then we complement that with our own data for the periods that the data set doesn't cover, which you can see here, 60 to 74 and 2010. Um, so that's how we quote the beginning of a mutual intervention. Um, then, when, for how long, when does a mutual intervention, uh, how does it continue? We consider it as ongoing as long as both states keep supporting rebels in the other state in consecutive year. And we do so even when those rebel groups drop out of uh, the armed conflict data set. Uh, so this is where we diverge a little bit then uh, from, from this data set, because otherwise to us, the whole list wouldn't make much sense. Uh, so here we would rely on expert literature, and if the expert literature says this group is still active, it's still being sponsored, we still cope it. Um, I don't want to spend too much time, but so the way that uh, Uppsala codes how interstate conflicts terminate, you sometimes get cases like in the Second Congo War, which lasted from 1998 to 2003, where because there was a peace agreement in 2001, they no longer consider the rally for Congolese democracy, the RCD, to have been fighting in 2002 or three. It drops out of the data set, although the RCD in those two years is still massively involved in violence against the Congolese state, right? And so we want to kind of capture, as area experts too, we want to kind of capture those kind of things, even though uh, they're not in that data set, that otherwise um, is quite useful. Um, so then, as I said, we focus quite a bit on how these mutual interventions actually end. And we distinguish four different types. Um, so the first one is this, uh, what we found surprising, that so many end through negotiated settlement that both states then actually honor in subsequent years, so they stop supporting rebel groups. Um, so you see that in 14 cases out of 23. Uh, a client victory means that in one of the interstate conflicts, the rebel group actually wins, and so there are six cases. Uh, the third most common outcome is a negotiated settlement that one state then reneges on. There are two cases, and both cases are actually apartheid South Africa that makes a deal with Mozambique, but then reneges on it, whereas Mozambique actually stops supporting um, uh, South African rebels. Uh, and the other case is actually South Africa Angola, where Angola then stops, but South Africa actually continues. And there's uh, one case of what we call a client defeat, so where a rebel group, uh, this is the Guinean Guinean rebel group, that is so weak that it basically gets eliminated by Guinea, by the armed forces of Guinea, and so uh, Liberia no longer has a rebel group to support, and so then turns into just Guinea supporting Liberian rebel groups, but Liberia no longer supporting uh, armed opposition groups in, in Guinea. Uh, and again, sort of in honor of studies and thinking about the important Cold War, post Cold War period, we can see here it's sort of broken down in those different time periods. And the one maybe thing that, uh, if you know the, if you know that time period in Africa well, rebels rarely ever win during the Cold War. Yeah, the seventy in Uganda in '86, but not involved in a mutual intervention is an exception. But only from 1991 onwards do we see uh, rebel groups. Uh, winning more frequently in rebel groups that are involved in mutual interventions. Um, but the important thing here is that negotiated settlements dominate in both time periods. Um, okay, so this is the actual data, which I'll just leave that on here for a minute. I'll try to show it to you in, in uh, ways that are a little easier to, di to digest. Um, we highlight here with a dotted line the Ethiopian Sudanese mutual intervention because it begins during the Cold War, but it ends in the first post-Cold War year. As studies at Laia in the article consider 91 to be the first year that the post-Cold War period um, starts. Um, yeah, and there's a few details there, where right? list the rebel groups that have been sponsored and so on. Um, and now I can show that again uh, during the Q&A if you have questions about the particular cases. I'm talking more about about the forest, as it were, rather than particular trees in, in this presentation, of course. So here's a visualization. Uh, the numbers here follow the chronological order of when mutual intervention started, and they're placed, these circles are placed on the border of the two states um, that interfered in each other's affairs by supporting rebel groups. You'll see that actually all of these cases are neighbors. Um, 
The one partial exception would be Angola and South Africa, but remember at the time South Africa actually controls Namibia. So in a way they're de facto neighbors, but right if we go with the UN General Assembly resolution that considered uh, South Africa's occupation of Namibia illegal, uh, that's why we don't uh, color it in white. But all of these are at least de facto neighbors, and so uh, you can maybe see that there are four geographic clusters. So the first is the Greater Horn from Chad to Somalia, uh, with nine mutual interventions, and eight of them actually involve Sudan. The only mutual intervention that doesn't involve Sudan is between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, this cluster is connected through Uganda, which we consider to be part of both this cluster here, so Uganda, Sudan, is part of the Greater Horn, but Uganda is also part of the Central African cluster. Uh, and again, there are nine mutual interventions. And again, all but one involve one state, and that's Congo. Right? So here you see, as in the big Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, at one point, Zaire. And so you see there are Lad's main focus, my main focus. This is why we both felt that this was such, a, such an important phenomenon in what we studied. So the one exception here in Central Africa is Angola <coughs> providing support to rebels in the Republic of Congo and the Congolese government providing support to Angolan rebels. And for that, it was quite quickly overthrown um, in 97. Um, then there is a, a third cluster, which is Southern Africa. Yeah, these are, these are um, the white minority ruled regimes at the time of Rhodesia and apartheid South Africa. Um, involved in mutual interventions with the so-called frontline states, so some of them, so Mozambique and Angola. Uh, and then finally there's a, and so here, sorry, the, the connecting country, as it were, is Angola. Yeah, Angola is involved in both, of, both the Central African and the Southern African cluster. And then we have a small isolated cluster of West Africa with two mutual interventions. You see here the 20th and 21st happening quite late. These are all basically all because of Charles Taylor, when Charles Taylor becomes the president of Liberia in 97. Right? He has all kinds of rivalries in the region, and, and those, uh, those are the two um, cases. Okay. So this is another way to visualize it, and how you, what you see here, the main point is there's a very big variation. Some mutual interventions last just one year, less than a year if you look at the monthly level. Others last for 12, 13 years. You also see that there are only two time periods in the early 70s and early 90s where there's not a single mutual intervention. Otherwise, there's always at, one, at least one um, happening in Africa. So this, in terms of temporal trends, is another way to visualize it. And uh, we could think of this as being three, uh, sorry, we sort of see two waves. Yeah, I would say this is the first wave, and it, it kicks off partly because Angola and Mozambique, former Portuguese colonies, become independent in 75 and then get involved in mutual interventions. Um, but it's also driven by some of the other regional clusters. And then just after the Cold War ends, there are two years where there's not a single mutual intervention, but then there's a massive increase here and a peak in 97 with eight mutual interventions at the same time. And this second spike is driven entirely by the Greater Horn and by Central Africa, and really by, as I said, Congo and Sudan and uh, neighboring states supporting the SPLMA, the Southern Sudanese rebels on the one hand, and then in the two Congo wars, neighboring states um, supporting Congolese rebels, and again, of course, Sudan and Congo retaliating off, and actually were the first movers, and it was, um, it was actually the neighboring states that retaliated. Um, because Sudan was trying to spread radical Islam. Uh, Congo, the story is a bit more complex. Very happy to talk about because that's what I mostly publish on. Um, but I'll, I'll try to move on uh, to talk a little bit about um, the, how, how uh, to compare uh, how mutual interventions end and interstate conflict end. So we draw here on the UCP conflict termination data set um, to look at how interstate conflicts end. And, and one big takeaway is that 20, in 20 out of 23 mutual interventions, so almost 90% of cases, even though the mutual intervention ends, so both states say, okay, we'll stop supporting each other's rebels, but at least one of the two interstate conflicts actually continue. So there's not a direct link that mutual interventions only end because the interstate conflict ends. 
uh, interstate conflicts end. The exceptions are Sudan Uganda 1972, where both conflicts also end. DRC Uganda 2002, if you trust the USDB coding, it's not that uh, the Ugandan rebel group actually disappears. And I repost Liberia um, in 2003. Uh, another interesting finding here so, this is just looking at so we, we aggregate here the outcomes of uh, client victory or client defeat, so that's seven, seven huge interventions. Um, or settlement, whether it's reneged on or not. And so remember, those are 16 cases, 14 plus 2. But then we look at the number of interstate conflicts, everything times 2. And you see here, even when one side in the mutual intervention, when the rebel clients of the one side win, and so of course those interstate conflicts end, the other interstate conflict actually still continues. So it's not that sort of that is a silver bullet to solving your trouble at home. Um, okay, and then there's other things here. The one other figure I maybe want to highlight is just that, so even if there is a negotiated settlement between the two states, only a, only a quarter of interstate conflicts then also end. So typically, typically um, they, they continue, um, right? So understanding negotiated settlements between states and then within states are largely distinct um, phenomena. Uh, this is just, we looked then of course to actually, right, we actually identified every single negotiated settlement and for a lot of them we also have the, the written text that's sometimes on the UN website. The one thing that I just want to highlight here, I'm not sure whether that shows very well, but in, in sort of gray there are three cases where the negotiated settlement is what we call indirect. So here it's not actually that the two states come together and just agree to stop supporting each other's rebels, but it actually stops as part of a as part of a resolution of one conflict. So just to take Mozambique and Rhodesia, so Rhodesia becomes Zimbabwe. Um, yeah, well, gained independence, broad, broadly speaking, more uh, became ruled by the, by the black majority. And so that then meant that Mozambique no longer had any reason to support the liberation fighters in Rhodesia because they basically, they won and turned the country into Zimbabwe. So that's a, an indirect settlement. But again, these are more the exception. The rule are the other 13 cases where the two states directly sort of cash out a deal, sign some sort of agreement or communique where they say, right, we, we commit to ending support to each other's um, opposition groups. And typically those uh, settlements actually work out. So um, I'm sort of running short of time, I think, but just um, to talk a little bit about the role of extracontinental actors, because because so both Alad and I are really interested in how African states interact with each other. But of, of course, a lot of scholars then ask us, right, but isn't this all just driven by like great powers, especially during the Cold War period? So here's some um, statistics to address that. So if we look at whether either state A or state B or the rebel clients of state A or state B received any support from a state not from Africa, yeah, an extracontinental state, then during the Cold War period, eight out of eight cases actually see some extracontinental involvement. And in 50% of cases, both states receive support from extracontinental states. In the post-Cold War period, that figure drops here from, to only 53%, and in terms of both states, there's only a single case. Um, so quite a difference. If we then look particularly just at the two states involved in the mutual interventions, um, you see um, 16 of the 12 states during the Cold War period received extracontinental support, but in the post-Cold War period, it's only 8 out of 30, so again, quite a significant change. And in terms of rebel clients in the Cold War period, every other rebel client also received some support from a state outside of Africa. So it's often the Soviet Union or the US, but it's also it's Israel, it's Iran, it's Saudi Arabia, Cuba, lots and lots of different cases. And this radically drops to just 4% in the post-Cold War period. Um, one of those cases is, for instance, France supporting uh, rebels in the Congolese in, in Republic of Congo. Um, and it's not just the French state, but it's also a French oil firm that supports the rebels. Um, but that's, that's another story, but again, it's rare, so this is very much in line with the general arguments and an argument that I make in my 2016 International Security article, that once the Cold War ends, 
if we look at regional security dynamics in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's primarily the Africans being involved in that, and extracontinental actors are no longer quite as interested. Um, another thing I want to highlight um, that doesn't relate to extracontinental support, but that does relate to the Cold War, post-Cold War period, if you look at how many indirect regional interventions there are and how many hybrid, uh, sorry, mixed ones there are, so whether there's true support or not, then almost all the cases, seven out of eight during the Cold War, don't see any direct troop support. The one exception I already mentioned is in Goa, as South Africa providing support to Angolan rebels. Whereas that shifts quite radically. So from 91 onward, the majority of cases, more than two thirds, actually see troop support by one side. And so these indirect or proxy mutual interventions become a lot rarer. Um, okay. This is the underlying data that these aggregate statistics draw. And if you actually want to see right, each sort of extra continental supporter, I can throw that up again. But it's really just to show you that the data is there. Um, and uh, so I just want to conclude. Um, I hope I didn't run over that too much. Um, so what we provide is the first comprehensive list of mutual interventions in Africa, and especially providing novel codings of how they end. Um, we show in the research mode that there are both conceptual and empirical differences um, between MIs and other types of hostile interstate interactions. And we highlight that negotiated settlements um, are by far the most common uh, way in which mutual interventions end. Um, one statistic I haven't thrown at you yet, I know there was a lot of data, but if you look at the Uppsala armed conflict data set, which also calls interstate conflict, and so it's interstate conflict here. The threshold is really low. It's two armies, yeah, two states fighting each other with at least 25 battle-related deaths in that year. There are actually only 14 interstate conflict years where two African states fight each other. We have 105 mutual intervention years. Yeah? So as I said at the beginning, if I wanted to be more hyperbolic, I would say that mutual interventions is how African states actually fight each other. So think of Stathis' substitution logic. African states, for various reasons we could discuss, often aren't maybe strong enough, uh, though they don't have the right incentives to directly fight each other with their own armies. So instead, what they use is they do it indirectly, right? They go through roads. Um, there are several avenues uh, for future research. So one could ask, why are there so many more mutual interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa than in other regions, uh, which would bring us to the distinction there are some, there are of course tip off very often one sided interventions, yeah, where just one state supports rebels, but then the other state doesn't retaliate, so why does it not retaliate in the form of also providing support to domestic opposition groups of, in the other state? Or actually, there's cases where the state retaliates but directly and so actually starts an interstate conflict. So, what determines these different choices of states? Um, why do some mutual interventions end in settlement, whereas others are sort of fought to the end, at least where one interstate conflict ends? So that's what we address in our second paper. Um, what is the role of third parties in all of this uh, in terms of mediating these mutual interventions? So Alad and I also address that in sort of our third paper on this bigger project. And then finally, one could ask how uh, determinations of mutual interventions then affect the dynamics of interstate conflicts and eventually. Um, also uh, determinations. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks a lot.